Thank you very much, Debbie. And um, hello, everyone. Uh, 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 it is my pleasure to be presenting my work um, at this webinar. Uh, so the focus for this presentation is on using artificial intel intelligence and machine learning methods in order to um, inform um, optimizations of truck platoons when uncertainties are involved. At the beginning of the presentation, I will uh, 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 go over a number of slides in order to motivate why it is that we um, need to focus on their uncertainties and what's the, the implications on the societies. And then I will explain the methodology and approach that we are taking in order to facilitate that optimization problem from the computational point of view. All right, so truck industry is an important uh, uh, sector of the economy. Uh, it contributes to 72% and 82% of nations uh, freight, weight, and revenue respectively in 2019. More than 40 million trucks uh, traveled uh, um, a mileage of a total of 490 billion miles in 2018 alone. Um, so, in terms of the consumption of uh, fuel, uh, this uh, truck industry accounts for 24% of the total U.S. transportation energy use in 2019. So, this is why we are facing, uh, uh, you know, shortages uh, long term. Uh, when long term is concerned, uh, especially on uh, the uh, non-renewable energy resources. So in particular, world oil reserves are not going to last forever. Uh, it is uh, expected that the, uh, the current oil reserves that we have is going to only last for 47 years. Uh, another aspect of truck industry is the, uh, the of uh, greenhouse gas. Uh, gases, so heavy duty vehicles account for 20% of the greenhouse gas emissions uh, in the transportation sector. Uh, so it is really important to look at the fuel efficiency of, of modes of transportation, including uh, uh, truck and freight transportation, uh, because it is important uh, for the environment and also for the energy economy. And the particular focus that we want to have is how can intelligent transportation systems, how can the uh, diffusion of technology, advanced you know, computational and communication technologies uh, can help with this fuel efficiency. So ITS, intelligent transportation systems and the technology that, uh, that, uh, is, uh, that it offers, uh, has already made several impacts on the safety and, and uh, efficiency of the mobility, and it has, you know, on track to, to enhance the American productivity by integrating these advanced communications and computing technologies into the transportation uh, sector. So some of the examples of um, use of intelligent transportation systems on um, on um, mobility and transportation and energy uh, efficiency around the world are listed here. Uh, I'm not going to go over every single point here, but um, some of the major trends that we see is that, for example, car sharing because of, you know, the use of apps and, you know, connectivities uh, mm -hmm. have reduced the total, you know, uh, vehicle miles traveled. And, uh, you know, the ability to have dynamic messaging systems or adaptive messaging systems that can also be used in order to reduce the total vehicle uh, miles traveled and that in turn is going to reduce the total uh, fuel consumption. And there has been um, uh, success stories around the world, as I said, uh, and there, some of the examples are listed here. Uh, the uh, integration of ITS has also resulted in mode shifts. So uh, it has been shown that, uh, for example, users prefer different modes of transportation, 
there is in particular broad uh, you know car ownerships are are you know on the decline um the there are some per vehicle travel effects also as a result of the integration of the um, ITS. Um, it has been shown again in some examples in the country and also around the world that uh, the integration of adaptive signal control systems, for example, uh, or adaptive cruise controls have resulted in significant fuel um, uh, consumption reduction. Um, all, another example is the incident and uh, transit uh, signal priority to to you know to encourage use of public transportation systems and and uh, shared mobility options. There, are, as I said, there are also some long-term implications as a result of the integration of ITS. Um, four years after the introduction um, of city car share. Car share in San Francisco Bay Area, uh, now 29% of the city car share members have gotten rid of one or more cars. So this really shows the the, the long-term trend that, uh, um, especially in the among the young generation, uh, millennials, uh, maybe their the preference to own a vehicle um, is not going to be there anymore. So that was just uh, a general uh, impact on, you know, uh, vehicle uh, transportation, different modes of transportation, but in particular for truck industry, uh, how can ITS uh, contribute to the fuel efficiency? So the connected truck market, uh, this is when uh, trucks are equipped with communication uh, technology and then they're driving conditions and and uh, their, their, their driving control can be um, uh, automate in an automated way be controlled by you know advanced uh, technology especially when re when their you know respective distance with other trucks and vehicles are concerned so that connected truck market is anticipated to 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 experience a significant growth uh, the growth rate is expected to be 17 percent uh, over the next five years and uh, through the connected uh, truck technology uh, uh, the fleet operators are, are anticipated to to optimize uh, more than you know 60 percent of the cost of ownership including the fuel and by 2026 more than 35 million trucks uh, around the world are expected to be connected and that is 40% of the fleet managers uh, right now, the perception and the, uh, the sentiment is really positive uh, uh, for uh, this particular technology. You see that 40% of the fleet managers believe that connected trucks are necessary. So we are, you know, we are experiencing this trend and this will become a reality um, now. Uh, one of the things, important changes that the use of ITS technology and communication is going to offer is the uh, possibility for an optimal uh, truck platooning. Uh, so truck platooning, uh, by definition, is linking two or more trucks in a convoy using connectivity technology and automated driving support systems. So the way that it works is that the truck at the head of the platoon acts as the leader and the vehicles that drive behind it, they're going to adapt their driving conditions according to the, the driving conditions of the, the leader truck in that convoy. If the platoons can be, um, if the truck platooning can be done effectively in a safe way and with optimal, you know, um, variables, then it is expected that uh, the fuel consumption is going to be reduced by 10%. There's going to be a reduction in CO2 emissions. Safety, as I said, is going to be a, um, a, a major aspect of it because of, again, the incident detection, the, the adaptive cruise control, and those um, technology that is added to the trucks. 
um, the there's going to be more efficient use of roads and um, this will also in the long run result in a better um, supply chain management there's going to be less congestion and uh, there's going to be a uh, advantage in uh, to the uh, fleet manager down the road so one particular um, advantage of truck platooning is the energy efficiency or fuel efficiency. So uh, the reason that this happens is that uh, uh, when you have a convoy of trucks, usually it is the leading truck that you know uh, experiences a drag, major drag, and uh, as you can imagine, the uh, trucks uh, second or third uh, truck that drives behind the leading truck, they're going to experience less uh, air drag. And air drag is, you know, uh, inversely correlated to uh, the, the fuel efficiency. So if you have a mode of a, a driving mode where drag is high on the vehicles, then you expect the fuel efficiency to be low. So there has been some studies. It has uh, been shown that in a two truck scenario, for example, uh, uh, platooning is going to save four and a half percent in fuel for the front truck and 10 percent um, uh, fuel efficiency or fuel saving for the, 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 the behind truck. So as you can see, uh, this uh, from the drag perspective, there's going to be major reduction uh, um, in terms of the fuel consumption. Also, because of the connectedness and the connectivity technology and uh, the autonomous driving technology, you expect to uh, experience less accelerate, acceleration and braking. And that is another source of um, um, efficiency that is added to this um, mode of um, travel. There are several problems. Um, there is the route planning, the longitudinal control, the lateral positioning, and so on and so forth. Um, in all these problems, uh, in order to arrive at the best platoon configuration, which essentially is determining the, the, the longitudinal uh, spacing between trucks and lateral position of the trucks, um, you need to run a, a computational fluid dynamic model in order to quantify the drag force. Uh, so computational fluid dynamics simulations are typically long uh, simulations. They're not easy um, problems to uh, solve using you know, finite elements or finite difference methods. So you, you typically need a you know, full-scale high fidelity simulation, and that may take hours, depending on how many trucks you have and what level of details you want to consider, how many uncertain factors you want to consider in your problem. So as I said, uh, computational fluid dynamics, uh, which um, uh, is needed for truck platooning problems, is computationally expensive. And this is particularly uh, challenging in optimization problems. The platooning is really an optimization problem you can't, because we want to arrive at the best spacing between different trucks. So um, you need to try different um, candidate configurations. And for each one of them, you need to run a CFD. So that really means that the call to CFD simulations are going to be repeated for, uh, for every new uh, candidate configurations. And Typically, in an optimization to be, you need to be to be over. Uh, we may be talking about you know hundreds uh, or thousands of different candidate configurations, depending on how many trucks we have in the platoon. So um, that is one challenge. Again, in optimization problem, we run these simulations repeatedly, and um, again that that cost may be prohibitive, depending on. On, um, on the size of the platoon. Also, there might be various sources of uncertainty that you want to account for, right? So in reality, things are not really deterministic. Uh, so in CFD, you need to know uh, and model the, the inlet or 
what's the flow incoming to uh, the truck platoon. And that really is an uncertain uh, factor. We don't want to necessarily optimize the platoon for a given uh, specific wind direction and wind speed, because in reality, you expect the platoon to experience different di wind directions uh, depending on uh, the freeway uh, direction and also wind direction could be you know inherently random and also wind uh, 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 speed could be random so that's uh, that's that really underlines this the importance of these uh, stochastic simulations right so for each one of these candidate configuration not only we need to run uh, a CFT simulation, but we need to also account for various sources of, uns of uncertainty and run multiple CFT simulations for each um, platoon configuration. So that, you know, all of a sudden becomes a kind of double jeopardy, right? So for each configuration, you need to have a single CFT in the deterministic case, but if you want to do it more realistically, in a more robust case, you need to repeat this over and over for different uncertain scenarios. All right, so what are uh, various sources of variability or uncertainty when we're you know, trying to optimize the configuration of a truck platoon? Um, there are various sources. Uh, geometry of the trucks are you know, variable. First of all, you may be dealing with you know, trucks uh, from different manufacturers. A different you know, uh, truck companies may be using different brands and uh, so even with a single brand the geometry may not be perfect they may add you know certain wind deflectors or certain pieces to to the trucks so the geometry may not necessarily be exactly the same between different trucks the headways and lateral positions uh, are not going to be precise because even with the uh, autonomous driving there's going to be some you know, imperfections there, so you can't really expect uh, the headways to be exactly the, um, the value that the optimization uh, model um, uh, produces. Uh, the platoon speed could be variable because of, again, you know, imperfections. Wind speed could be uh, variable and wind direction as well. So let's take a look at this idea of surrogate based optimization so on the left i'm showing the kind of pipeline for the platooning uh, problem where we want to consider uncertainties and um, what happens here is that for a candidate platoon configuration this includes uh, the spacing between different trucks uh, the position and uh, and the lateral position and longitudinal position for each candidate configuration, you need to run multiple stochastic simulations, given the uncertainty in the wind speed, wind direction, and so on and so forth. And after you're done with that, you calculate the aerodynamics response here and its gradients, which are used in the gradient-based optimization in order to point you to the best configuration. And then you go and try a new configuration based on these gradients, essentially showing that this if you change the spacing in this direction it's gonna result in a better configuration but then you have to try it again to see if that was uh, in fact the case and this loop is gonna be repeated over and over all right so uh the key point here is that if you are using ansys abacus or a high fidelity simulation uh, this may be prohibitively long uh process in order to optimize this platoon configuration. Um, so the solution that we are trying to offer is based on these concepts of using a surrogate, which is an approximate model that replaces the full scale stochastic simulation. So the idea here is that, for instance, we could use deep neural networks uh, where when you have a particular a platoon configuration and there are a number of uncertain variables instead of having to run an ANSYS simulation each time to calculate the drag force for example 
you just need to evaluate or run these deep neural networks uh, in order to calculate the drag and also the gradient of the drag with respect to the design variables. So the main difference between these two figures is that these deep neural networks are easy to evaluate, right? I mean, they take seconds or sometimes less than a second to just evaluate these uh, drag forces using deep neural network surrogates. Okay, so as a result, once this model is trained, it can be used inside an optimization, and that optimization is going to be a lot faster than a, a full-scale optimization here using a high-fidelity um, numerical simulation. So deep neural networks these days, I mean, we we um, see uh, there's in various applications. So a deep neural network really offers a function approximation. Uh, so when you have an input and output, uh, and there is a mapping between the input and outputs, uh, neural networks create a, an approximation uh, uh, with uh, some you know, hidden layers and some in unknown parameters that links the inputs, in this case x, to outputs, which is u. And this uh, mapping is a nonlinear mapping. So, for example, in our problem, the input layer could be truck geometry, uh, uh, the wind speed, wind direction, the imperfect positions of the trucks, and the output of this neural network could be the drag force. So, in other words, if you have a, a new candidate configuration, instead of having to run a CFT, you can just enter the values here on the input layer and you know, run this neural network in order to produce the prediction for the drag force. So uh, deep neural networks have um, a lot of parameters. So that's one thing that we should note here. Usually there are several hidden layers here. And by the addition of each hidden layer, depending on the size of the hidden layer, you're going to add a lot of new you know, weights and biases, and uh, you need to estimate those. And usually, we estimate those in a supervised learning fashion. So what that means is that you obtain samples of the inputs and samples of the outputs, uh, and then uh, you train this neural network by essentially going through different choices of the parameters for these neural networks that best explains the data. So here, for example, what I have here is the drag force that you get from your ANSYS simulation or Abacus simulation. And this is the corresponding configuration and you know, wind speed and wind direction and uh, uh, the geometry uh, uh, parameters of the trucks. So if you enter this here, your neural network is going to predict this drag force and this is the actual drag force that you get from ANSYS. So I play with this theta, which are the set of parameters, in order to minimize the distance between these two quantities. So my predicted drag force, I want it to be as close as possible to what I get from ANSYS. And usually, you could do this for all the training data in a regression kind of uh, problem. Uh, but the key point in the success of deep neural network it has been because of this use of a stochastic gradient descent. So what that means is that if you consider this to be the parameters of the model, the parameter of your deep neural network surrogate, this is a very unrealistic case. There is only two parameters, but just in order to visualize this, that's the best that I could do. Um, so essentially what happens is that you want to this by i mean the training itself is an optimization problem so um uh there is a lot of optimization involved but this this is the optimization that we are doing in order to create the best computational model so here we're searching for the best model parameter uh if you use the gradient based optimization it's likely that you get into a local minima and not get to, for example, here, which is the global minimum. By doing a stochastic gradient descent, there are two things that we do. Is uh, that we, in each step, we are not trying to look at 
all the training data. So by the training data, I mean the samples, simulation samples from ANSYS or Abacus. You could have thousands of simulation data for your training, but in this stochastic gradient descent, we're not gonna look at all those data in order to see how good of a fit this model has or offers. Instead, um, what we're gonna do is to look at a very small subset of those training data in a, in a kind of batch, in a mini batch, and then look at how good the model is in with respect to those you know a small subset of the training data and then when we go to the next step we create we sample a different subset of the training data what that does is that um it could be that your steps are may not be the best steps because you're not looking at the whole training data to see how good your model is but it will first of all uh, it will be uh, a very computationally efficient approach uh, because of the small sizes in each mini batch. And also it will uh, be more likely that you don't get stuck in a local optima because you're not so obsessed with how good your steps are. Um, and you could make some mistakes and down the road, if it's um, you're less obsessed with making mistakes, at the end, actually it will be a, a um, kind of counterintuitive situation where, where allowing for errors or mistakes is going to lead to a better outcome and it's been shown over and over in the success of deep neural networks. So as you can see here, it's, this is a visual sketch of how uh, taking um, erroneous steps can get you away from this, you know, black hole of um, uh, local minima and get you eventually to the global all right, so let's see how we um, uh, solve the uh, surrogate-based uh, problem for truck platooning. So as I said, one of the factors that we are, would like to consider is the truck geometry. So you could have platoons of trucks with various geometry, and uh, uh, there are various kinds of uh, uh, trailers and, uh, um, you know, car, uh, truck companies, manufacturing companies that you uh, could choose from. So these are the types of trucks that uh, we have in the North, North America. So that's, uh, we've gone through those resources. The other thing is that the wind speed could be uncertain, right? So um, we're gonna be using a wavelength distribution for the wind following the studies that I'm listing here. Uh, the wind distribution varies for, with season, with land type, with day and night, but for a given season and a given location, we could um, uh, use uh, the given, uh, the corresponding wavelength distribution, okay? So if you have a um, particular location, if you're in a particular location, a particular season, uh, we have a wavelength distribution that we can use in order to, uh, to, to, to inform the, the wind speed. All right, so um, the, the, pro the, the workflow for uh, creating this neural network for the calculation of the drag force is the following. So what uh, we have done uh, in the first step is to try to, as a proof of concept, see if it works on a two-truck model. As I said, uh, running a CFD simulation for um, la larger, you know, platoons is take a lot of compute time. So we started with two trucks here. Uh, so what we're uh, seeing here is the steps that we're uh, taking. So the first step is to define a simple uh, uh, model truck uh, for in terms of its, its geometry, right? So this is a, a geometry where you can change different parameters in the mathematical um, representation and with different parameters, you get a different geometry for that body. So once you have that model, then you can realize different trucks, right? You can realize different shapes. And uh, as a result, you can have different, you know, variability in the geometry. Then you could have a set of random parameters that 
the, that um, specifies the headways and lateral positioning. And you generate random velocity inlet. This is a combination of the wind, uh, wind speed and wind direction, and also uh, the, the speed of, of the trucks. So once you have all these realizations, so that, that is just one scenario, and then you do repeat it over and over, and you could create you know, thousands of scenarios in terms of different shapes, different speed, different directions, and uh, positioning. So for each one of those, we run a CFD simulation in ANSYS. And uh, once we have that training data, we want to see how good a deep neural net can predict the drag, co the drag force for new scenarios, for scenarios that the training has not seen yet. All right, so this is a model. Uh, so we uh, consider randomization of the following dimensions, the trip, the cabin, the nose, and the wind deflector. Okay, so we have this, you know, this representation for each uh, one of these dimensions, if you kind of randomize, give a sign of value from the rain, then you'll get a realization of the geometry. So then, using that, we ran a CFD simulation. In particular, for this uh, results that I'm showing, we ran 1,000 realizations of two truck platoons. And this is a very time consuming uh, undertaking. We had to use supercomputers in order to to um, to facilitate the simulation of these trucks on um, uh, on ANS, uh, with ANSYS. And the process that is done in ANSYS is called design of experiments. This is where you kind of vary a combination of factors, and each one of those. You know, can it, uh, each one of those combinations creates a scenario, and then you can have ANSYS uh, execute that scenarios on the supercomputer. And this is the great results that we have obtained. So what I'm showing here is the the errors on the y-axis. That's the error in the predicted quantity, which is the drag force. And this is the training of the neural network. So what I'm showing here is that. Out of that 1,000 data that we created, we use only 85% of it in order to train the neural network. And we are using 15% of that data uh, uh, in order to uh, just do the, the test. So these 15%, as I said, is different from this 85%. So that's uh, these the, the scenarios or combinations that we're testing the neural network on has not been previously observed in the training data. You see with this 1,000 simulation, we have created a neural network, a deep neural network, which is a fully connected neural network. And the accuracy is about 90%, which is, which is uh, uh, pretty, um, uh, pretty good for, for this very complex nonlinear uh, model. All right. so. Now, extending this to longer platoons. So in particular, uh, uh, we have uh, right now, this is the ongoing work. Uh, we are uh, trying to uh, test a hypothesis. So the hypothesis that we want to first test is that um, we would like to get a model where uh, the model is applicable not to only a particular platoon size, so for example, we don't want to produce different models for like a three truck platoon and a separate model for a four truck platoon and so on and so forth. So we want to see if there is uh, any pattern or if there are ways that we can train a model uh, that can be used, a neural network model that can be used for variable platoon size. So the, the hypothesis that we have here is that if you, for example, create an, a neural network for a five truck platoon, um, and then, rem then you want to now apply it for a four truck platoon, what happens is that if you look at this um, velocity fuse around the, the trucks or these bodies from the top view, uh, you see that, for example, if you remove uh, the fourth one uh, and 
kind of replace it with the last truck, maybe the, the overall you know, um, velocity fields are not going to be that different. Okay, or it's not going to be exact, but there might be some, you know, features there that we can explore. And what that means is that it's going to help us with the training, right? Otherwise, you have to create a whole new training for a, a, a platoon with a new size. Okay, and um, so this is this is an ongoing work. So we are uh, producing the five truck um, uh, training data as we speak, and then, as I said, the last, the next step is to to run a four truck platoon and see whether by subtracting this and replacing this with uh, with a, a, a fifth truck, whether the neural network representation can offer accurate. Um, prediction for the drag conditions. Uh, another ongoing work is to use a single truck neural network. So, uh, so far what I've presented is when you use a deep neural network for the whole platoons. Uh, even though the neural network can also produce individual drag force for each one of those trucks, but then that neural network is to be used for the whole platoon. So, Again, in order to facilitate this and make it generalizable to any platoon with any size, if somebody comes and says, uh, we have a platoon of 10 trucks. Uh, so the way to really approach that problem, another al alternative would be to create modular uh, surrogates uh, for a single truck um, uh, aerodynamics uh, conditions. So what I'm showing here is that you could say uh, for intermediate trucks, I built a neural network. And then if I have three or four or five or more of these trucks to be in the platoon, I'm just going to repeat those uh, neural network surrogates in between. I'm going to put four or five of them, depending on how many of them I need. And since these are modular units, they can be able to predict the overall um, uh, platoon conditions uh, in terms of the aerodynamic uh, field around the platoon once they're you know, linked together in a proper way. The approach that you, you're um, taking uh, for this particular uh, project is uh, using convolutional neural networks. So convolutional neural, neural networks, or in short CNN, uh, is a machine learning approach to analyze images. Uh, and uh, it has been widely used in image classification, segmentation, detection, and so on and so forth. So the input layer to the neural network, instead of having a vector of numbers, here is in the form of a two-dimensional pixelized uh, input layer. And then the output could be a scalar or a vector, depending on what it is that we want to predict. Uh, so what I'm showing here is based on one of our, you know, other works uh, on the design optimization for, for structures. So here you see that, for example, we have the pixel by pixel information about the shape of the, um, of the structure. And then you can predict, for example, their, the performance of that uh, structure, the compliance or deflections and so on and so forth. So now, how is it that we're applying this to the platoons, uh, uh, and especially in CFD problems, when you look at the conditions that you see here, um, this is really an image, right? So I'm showing the velocity fields here. So the output from this model really is uh, something that you see in terms of um, the, um, so the representation is really an image, right? So you could use image-based um, approaches in order to predict the performance or the response of that, that medium, okay? We have used this idea in a separate work. This is uh, where we uh, uh, wanted to see how uh, the, the physics constraint can be used in order to um, optimize the performance of, of, of CFD surrogates. So um, here, uh, what I'm showing is the use of CNN in order to 
pre uh, to predict the uh, flow around a vehicle um, and the velocity field or pressure field around the vehicle. So what I'm showing here is that eventually in the test data, I would like to have different geometries for the vehicle and I would like to the, the CNN to produce a you know velocity field around that vehicle for me. So uh, the idea which is um, the, the original credit is to go in 2016, what he did was that he uh, trained a neural network for different um, kind of candidate shapes. And then once the neural network learned enough um, in terms of like different shapes and different combinations of edges and corners, then you could feed it with a very sophisticated image and it could still predict the, the velocity of field. So what I'm showing here, this is the exact value coming from a CFD simulation, full scale simula simulation. And this is the represent, this is the approximation by the neural network. So we've used uh, in this work that I'm citing below, we use the, the physics constraint, which is the governing Navier-Stokes uh, model, partial differential equations, in order to better um, um, inform the training. Because if you don't include the physics, the training will be purely data-driven. You're just looking at the results from um, the ANSYS simulation, and you don't necessarily care about the governing equation and what you know um, whether a candidate prediction makes sense physically, right? Uh, whether it satisfies the conservation laws or physics laws or not. Here we included the physics-driven regularization, and as you can see, the among the uh, um, the um, different ways of regularizing the the training of the neural network, we got the best performance. This is another uh, future work that I'm showing here. Uh, so um, the particular focus here is that in addition to um, in addition to picking the best spacing between the trucks, you could also attempt at uh, uh, optimizing the shape of the bodies, right? So in particular, I mean, we, once you have a truck, you can't really remanufacture uh, uh, the body, right? Uh, but there are parts of the, uh, the truck that you could um, probably adapt. Uh, so for example, the wind deflector, the angle of the wind deflector or the shape of it, that could be something that you can optimize depending on the wind condition and the driving condition. So, uh, so this this is for this you could use the idea of um, um, you know using uh, CNN and variational autoencoder in order to optimize the shape of the the, the plot. What I'm showing here is uh, another uh, previous work that uh, we have uh, done in our group in order to optimize the shape of the structures when load is uncertain, and uh, you could use variational autoencoders which are a particular form of neural networks which, gener which generate candidate shapes and geometries, and then you could use those candidate shapes in order to best uh, optimize the shape of, of, of that system, energy uh, engineering system, depending on the energy consumption and so on and so forth. So once you have all this, you know, surrogate-based optimization, then uh, at the end, you want to use it in order to inform decisions. So one of the um, decisions that we would like to inform is essentially building upon the prior work that we've had in our uh, group here at uh, um, UIUC. This is, uh, in particular, the work that was led by uh, Professor Oyang and Professor al uh, where they looked at the trade-off between fuel consumption and the, the, the pavement condition. Uh, so uh, that was a platooning problem uh, where if you basically try to only look, look at the, uh, the air drag and minimize the drag force, then probably lining up uh, the trucks in a perfect condition would be the best option. But what that creates over time is that you have uh, the, um, you know, 
repeated impact on the pavement in the same location over and over and over time because of also the small spacing between the trucks that creates uh, damages to the pavement, which may not be um, what we um, really uh, uh, prefer. So there is really a trade-off uh, between, between the aerodynamic conditions and the pavement damage. So in this work, um, so our colleagues, uh, they've looked at this problem, this multi-objective problem, uh, in order to optimize a scenario where the trade-off is, is accounted for. Uh, so uh, in what we're planning on doing is to consider the uncertainties in the wind uh, profile and also the configuration and also the geometry of the trucks in order to, to solve that problem under the impacts of uh, uncertainty. So uh, that's all that I have to present today. And thank you for uh, your attention. And these are the credits for the images that are used in this presentation. Thank you for your presentation, Dr. Uh, Madani. Um, very interesting research you've been conducting. Um, we'd like to spend the remainder of our time taking questions from the audience. And it looks like we already have a few. Um, the questions that we don't have time for, uh, we will send to uh, Dr. Madani and he can respond to those um, directly. Um, so first one is, how will operators know if mechanical problems will develop? If mechanical problems and uh, so, um, so uh, are, are talk, uh, I think if I understood this correctly, uh, I think uh, they're asking about the platooning, right? If platooning. right, so if, if inside a platoon, then there is some mechanical uh, problems that could occur. Um, uh, so this is really dependent on the on on the technology. Um, so if it is autonomous driving, and then there are sensors and uh, mechanical problems uh, are going to be detected, probably that can be communicated uh, in a timely manner to the rest of the trucks, and then they can always switch back to the the, the non platoon driving mode. So um, I think the key point here is that. Um, uh, if the platoons are used, there will be definitely, um, uh, the, in order to have a robustness, there will always be an effective option for uh, depart, departing from a platoon, right? So you could uh, definitely, that would be a situation where um, uh, there will be me mechanisms for how to uh, kind of quickly, in a, in a safe and efficient way, uh, kind of disintegrate the truck uh, or, dis uh, or disintegrate the platoon and separate them, and that, that should be um, uh, properly done. I am uh, not an expert in terms of how the technology of the autonomous driving uh, aspects and, and how that can, can handle that situation. I hope that I understood the question properly and answered. <laughs> If not, they can put something in the chat box. Sure. Um, have the benefits from truck platooning on signalized arterials been studied? And does that help? Or has it been mostly just freeways? That's a great question. Um, I haven't seen any study as on the, uh, the signalized uh, arterials. And usually the focus that we've had so far has, all, uh, has also been mainly on, on freebase. Um, but um, I haven't seen any, any work that, that uh, considers that. Um, how does the platoon handle, this is probably gonna be up the same vein, but how does the platoon handle the last mile of the trip in the urban core? Yeah, so that's, a, the, again, that's, a, that's an important um, point. Uh, I think one of the things that uh, we need to consider, and, and this is probably something that I need to look into, I don't know this off the top of my head, is that this energy consumption and the, the reduction in the energy consumption is a factor of the, the speed, right? So if, if the trucks are not traveling with a high speed, then uh, maybe platooning uh, is not gonna impact the, the reduction in the fuel 
um, as much as it does when they're traveling at 70 miles per hour and so on and so forth, right? So there is going to be uh, less fuel saving when we're talking about uh, you know lower speeds and probably cases where there the, it's a stop and go situation and um, um, so 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 the the the, the advantage is going to be less um, from the fuel consumption point of view. Of course, from um, uh, the the you know the proper use or maximal use of the roadway capacity, having you know uh, shorter um, headways and safer driving conditions. That those advantages are going to be definitely there. But our focus in this study has been on the fuel consumption, and usually that's something that's realized and, and significantly when we are talking about you know traveling speeds of you know freeways and so on and so forth. Okay, question regarding physics-driven regularization. How do you learn the parameters of your physics formula that you use as a regulizer? Okay, that's a great question. And uh, uh, so this uh, work, I mean, whenever we're trying to use physics in order to um, to train a neural network, and this this whole thing is a really new field of research. It started probably three years ago, 2019. Um, uh, usually, when we say physics informed deep learning or physics physics informed training, uh, that means that we know everything about the physics, and so um, that's the typical case where the parameters of the physics uh, model, the physical laws. This could be the the coefficients in the partial differential equations and so on and so forth, they are known, right? So they're known to us and we are just trying to use that knowledge in order to, uh, to estimate the parameters of the neural network model. But having said that, there are also uh, recent works where you can use this physics informed uh, learning uh, in a way that the parameters of the physics model can also be updated in, in you know, conjunction with the uh, with the updates of the neural network models. Okay, I think this might be our last question. Um, did you consider introducing wheel wander into your study when looking at pavement impact and wind optimization? So this was what uh, that's 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 the study that uh, was done by uh, my uh, colleagues. Uh, 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 Professor Oyang and Professor Alkadi. Right now, we are just focusing on uh, doing the not not doing the wonder on the impact of the wonder on the pavement damage, but uh, we are using the the variable position of the trucks, and that creates some lateral um, positioning. So you see here, for example, the the trucks are not lined up. So this is looking from the top, so the trucks are not necessarily lined up. So there are some some wonder here. I mean, um, but um, uh, we are not kind of including the impact of that on the pavement yet. But the, the but the left but the lateral positioning and uh, the uncertain lateral positioning and uncertain longitudinal positioning is included in this neural network model.